Lancashire, called Swarthmore Hall, where the mistress of the house, Margaret Fell, held sway. Uh, according to uh, her custom, she invited him to stay and his friend. They slept in the stable, in the, in the straw, and he gave a sermon. The sermon itself, well, one had the feeling she had heard it all before. However, the next morning, there was a church service in the village. <coughs> Everybody went there. George Fox went too. And lo and behold, in the midst of the service, he leapt to his feet <laughs> and spoke his piece. He said to the unfortunate priest, his name was Priest Lampet, he said, I know what Christ says. I know what Paul says. But what canst thou say? Well, if you ask a priest that, you shut him up for hours. <laughs> and um, there was someone, uh, one of the, the squires, who leapt to his feet, said, get that creature out of here. At which Margaret Fell said, no, let him speak which was quite unusual, to say the least. And she spoke. He spoke. And what he said was, so spoke, so spoke to her condition that she became, well, you might say a friend. Be it a friend on her own terms. And this is what we have to state today in this introduction. The cradle of Quakerism was rocked by two. It was George Fox who rocked it in a rather wild manner, and it was Margaret Fell who restrained him. But more than that, Margaret Fell was the first to whom it occurred that all this talk about that of God in the other and love and the first to whom it occurred that they might do something for others had not occurred to anyone. It was all their own soul. If you read the Gnostic Gospels, you'll see it is all about the personal soul. There's not a word about, well, I, I may not be totally certain that there's somebody you know, in trouble. Let's give him a hand. Aha, that was not part of the picture at the time. It was Margaret Fell who introduced that. And the first, she adored George Fox. Well, he was 28, she was 38. There was, let us say, a, a, a vivid, in, a warm interest between them, which was in all innocence, because in those days, uh, it was not as free and easy as it is now. Uh, a ministry, as I heard, uh, last week about that sexuality is a lovely thing. I don't think one would have heard that in Swarthmore Hall at that time, which doesn't mean it isn't true. Um, the first conflict came that George Fox started, in, well, not an organization so much as an administrative entity, which he called Meeting for Suffering. And the sole purpose of his meeting for sufferings was to list all those who had suffered for their Quakerism, who were imprisoned, who had been, you know, brought down. All those were listed, and he was going to send that list to the to Cromwell. And Margaret Fell said, "Well, what sufferings is he talking about?" Well, he said, "Those in prison." Said, "Well, let's do something about those in prison rather than send a list of them to Cromwell." That to him was total news. That never occurred to him. Never did, as a matter of fact. It was just one of her quirks that she, yeah. So Margaret Fell introduced into the Society of Friends this concept which is very important to this meeting as you are, alas, the Hicksite meeting without knowing it. And the Hicksite meeting is to say that you're service-oriented, or supposed to be. That's how we were first called after the great schism 
in 1827, and the Society of Friends split asunder into the Orthodox and into the service or the oriented or otherwise known as the activists. And the voice of the activist became Elias Hicks, and so we were called Hicksites. Margaret Fell is the one to whom every one of us who is involved in service is immeasurably indebted. She was the one who found God not only within, but found him in the eyes of the other. She was, or became, <coughs> compassion embodied. She was the one who went into Lancaster Castle and, Castle and concerned herself with the children who were about to be hanged, which one did in those days. She was the one who later started a a group of women to help the prisoners in London, in a jail in London, especially the children again. And as every woman who was alone and walked those halls was raped, uh, she gave them a uniform, green and red, so as to alert those who had evil plans, don't do it because she's the one who helps. Uh, she was imprisoned for life in Lancaster Castle at a given moment, because to be a Quaker became an offense. And uh, she was pardoned after six years. She spent six years in prison in Lancaster Castle and came out radiant. George Fox, in the meantime, had written his journal. And there had been a loving conflict between uh, Margaret and George, because George encouraged miracles, uh, passionate expressions of faith, uh, extremes like old women who stark naked, having smeared themselves with excrement, marched into churches saying, this is how thy soul smells at the last trump. Well, <laughs> probably, <laughs> but it was not to Margaret Fell a welcome expression of the spirit of Quakerism. Uh, George Fox even raised the dead. There was some difference of opinion as to whether they were legally dead or just, let's say, had an out-of-body experience. But he raised them. And uh, there were many imitators, so there were young friends who would stop bodies from being buried until they had done whatever they could to raise them. Um, all that George put in his journal. And they were married once she was out of prison. Uh, they had a stillborn child, which was really something at her age, and uh, which was not talked about and the, the existence of which was hushed up. Uh, then he died at the age of 62, when, and she lived on until 86, 87. Uh, a committee was appointed to edit his journal. And uh, that committee, um, it was Thomas Elwood was the one who uh, was the head of that committee. But of course, they would not have made any changes in the writings of the founder without his widow saying, hey, what are you doing? So it is not Thomas Elwood, it is Margaret Fell, who determined the nature of the journal, which for generations was the basis of this, the convictions, the, let us say, yeah, the convictions, the, 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 the spirit of the Society of Friends. And it's a forgery. Because Margaret, with the determination that was her tremendous power, edited out all the things she didn't approve of. Like the raising of the dead, the smearing with excrement, the, you know, no, she didn't think that helped. Um, so the Elwood Journal of George Fox is not George Fox as he was, but as 
Margaret Feld had decided he should have been. <laughs> it was only in 1913 that the original manuscript of George Fox's journal was discovered. It's called the Cambridge Edition, in which all that stuff comes back. And you can, on reading it, you can only thank the spirit of Margaret Feld that she protected us from this. <laughs> because I can tell you that but for her, we would have been one of those sects that sprang up under Puritanism, that lived as long as its founder lived, and then petered out. That is not the case in the case of the Society of Friends, and you are here to prove it. So we are here together under the aegis of Margaret Fell. Is that enough for today? No. I have no idea. No? Oh, you have another 15 minutes? I do? Oh, Terrific. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, George Fox had died. Margaret Fell had become the mother of Quakerism. She saw to it that nobody was in prison, no friend was in prison for his faith without a food parcel, a Bible, warm socks. They had a terrible conflict, she and uh, George, about bed socks. <laughs> um, he found out after he came home from, you know, a series of occasions where this, the, the, you know, the power of the Lord thundered mightily among them. <laughs> and he found a whole group of women wrapping up food parcels, and he saw that bed socks went in. And for some reason, the bed socks got to him. He said, these people are there. They were they, not he. They were there. They are there in an imitation of Christ. Christ did not wear any bed socks, which I must say, I love that. I say, <laughs> if we realize that it, at our origin, we were not just talking about high spiritual concepts, but that there was a conflict between our two founders, very loud voiced about the fact that Christ did not wear any bed socks, and that makes me feel very close to reality. <laughs> Anyhow, she won, of course. And, uh, <laughs> so friends imprisoned for their faith were given parcels with Bible, food, uh, ways to write down, because they had to write down their experiences, and bed socks. Um, this created a new influx of converts, because you were never incarcerated <laughs> alone in those days. There were all these creatures together with lights and scratching, you know, whatever. and they saw this one holy person <laughs> unwrapping Bible, <laughs> yum yum, and bed socks. Who sent you that? Oh, that was sent by meeting for sufferings. Meeting who? <laughs> and it was explained. And many requests came in to become members. <laughs> it was a form of convincement that turned out to be more solid than one might think, because a number of those who were converted by bed socks ended up in America with William Penn. Um, the spirit of the Friends at the time, as it would remain for the length of our days, was divided. It was united in the concept of the immediate presence of God and meeting for worship, being waiting upon the Lord, all that we were united in. We were united that there shall be no creed, no dogma, no priest, no steeple house, no asking for money, no hymns, all that, yes. But service, hmm? that was a problem. Because as throughout Protestantism, there has always been this Calvinist concept that service will not lead to salvation. That 
was even considered to be a heresy at a given moment. And I remember I grew up uh, in a Calvinist <coughs> house. My mother was a Quaker. My father was a Calvinist minister, an adorable man. Oh, I loved him to bits. And um, he was a great preacher. Like George Fox, the Lord thundered mightily among us. He didn't do a damn thing. I mean, if the, the sick had to be visited, my mother did. Uh, if people came in spiritual trouble, unless they were women, my mother would talk to them. <coughs> and he gave the most glorious sermons. So I have a feeling that uh, mutatis mutandi, I lived in my childhood in the 17th century between George Fox and Margaret Fell. Um, the Calvinist concept, which was the Puritan concept, was that you, it was decided before your birth even, whether you were going to be saved or damned. And if you did good, it made no difference in the future of your soul, because that was one of the great reasons why Luther had stood up to the church, because you could pay for salvation. If you made a good contribution, well, your chances were better than if you did not contribute at all. Uh, Margaret Feld disagreed. She said, only service will lead to salvation, if that's what you want which was a question that sent shivers down people's spine because it implied that you didn't give a damn what happened to your soul as long as there was one person on earth who needed your help. We have to be very much aware, friends, of those two poles of the Quaker persuasion. It's between those two that every meeting, if it's any good, swings. There are always those, the old activists, the old, let's say, the relatives of Margaret Phil, who say, okay, all that talk, terrific, but what are we doing? Yes, but you must talk, we must have this for the sake of your soul. I said, well, quite frankly, if I'm totally honest with myself and you, I don't give a damn what happens to my soul. I don't know what my soul is. I, I don't know what it is, but I know when I see someone lying on the pavement who is alone and miserable and helpless, and if I don't go and minister to him, well, I wonder what will happen to my soul if I have one. Uh, it is the polarity within the society in which we feel comfortable. If the weight went one way, instead of being in continuous equilibrium, I don't think many of us would be here. Because we may think that we come to Quaker meeting to sort ourselves out or to, to see clear or to, to wait upon the Lord, which in practice means waiting upon the interminable ministry from those who talk about things that are not foremost in your, among your needs. Uh, if there were not this tension between the two poles of Quakerism, I don't think we'd live. I think we'd go. Because then, well, never mind what then. That's all speculation. So live together, do realize that you're either Margaret Fell or George Fox, and that somehow you have to make the best of it. And that when all is said and done, Margaret Fell will correct your journal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Could we take five minutes? Oh, man, you can take any amount of minutes you like. Uh, Questions? Yeah. Yes, are there any questions? But that would be, I think people are yearning for some libation, no? Well, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, you 
went very fast uh, about the marriage. I was wondering when when were they married? And when was she in prison? Was she in prison before? Yes, she, she was a widow. How old were they? They were married. Uh, well, she was by then in her late forties, and uh, he was about ten years younger. So when they were married? Yes. In and uh, but she was in prison. It was when she came out of prison, and um, it was a very happy marriage. Well, you know, as, as marriages go, I mean, uh, very happy. There was there was a lot of conflict, and uh, I was in a sense I had a, a backwash of this conflict because I wrote a book in my callow youth uh, called Peaceable Kingdom, um, in which I described the relationship between Margaret Fell and George Fox as I had read it from. The journals, especially hers, and her correspondence, which was enormous. She wrote to everybody. She spent her entire day in prison writing. She wrote letters to, uh, by then, King Charles, uh, who was back on the throne. And um, she addressed him as dear heart, which he loved. <laughs> so it was really, uh, I think he was very influential in getting her out. That was Charles II, not Charles I. Um, Charles I was the one who was asked whether he was comfortable <laughs> by the execution. Um, well, uh, the, they, they married after they were after she came out of prison, so they were uh, of a certain age. Even so, uh, when I had written this book, there was uh, quite a sort of protest among what was then known as the Mandarins and their wives <laughs> in Philadelphia. <laughs> and a delegation of women <coughs> went to see Henry Cadbury, who was at the time the current weighty friend of the Society of Friends. A very small, wiry man, absolutely lovely man, who received the, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in behalf of the French Service Committee in a, a tuxedo that he had found among the warm clothes, contributed to to the French Service Committee. So after him, they, had, they spruced him up a bit, and when he was through, they went back into the bag. <laughs> uh, they, uh, these women came to him and said, uh, Henry, this boy, which was I, by then in my 40s, but still a boy, um, he has slandered dear George and Margaret by suggesting that there was any carnal interest between them. <laughs> at which Henry said, Car he had a very high voice, carnal interest? Hell, they had a child. <laughs> uh, so that was the tone of <laughs> like the mandarins at the time and I hope it still is <laughs> any more questions uh, she was um, five years older than she no more than, more than five more she than was five? yes I think almost ten years old and um, Uh, Ali Moha, uh, Mohammed oh, Ali, Mohammed Ali, one, Ali, yes, he's he the one. Found, who, he was the one who. He was the one who found the found jar. Those, uh, yeah. He found those papers. Yeah. With the jar. Yeah, he found the jar and smashed it, and out mm -hmm. came. Yeah. You know. And we mentioned that. The like contribution this. to the fire in which the heart of his enemy was cooked. It's an interesting beginning. Yeah. From us all. Yes. I wonder what kind of debt we owe to judge that. Ah. Judge Fell was a, uh, what a marvelous, <laughs> melancholy character. Uh, he was, from his writings and what you hear about him, he was a, what, the kind of, of civil servant, you ought to call him that, but they called him that. You still find in England, although more rarely nowadays, he was a Roman. Don't forget the Roman, the, the, the English lived under Roman occupation. The Roman law is still the basis of English jurisprudence. And uh, he was the man who uh, read Tacitus at bedtime, and uh, which doesn't seem to make for a very lively marital life. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he was a dear man. He was a lovely man. And he, when his wife started to have meetings, Quaker, Quaker meetings at Swarthmore Hall, He'd never take part, but he'd, they left the door open, and he'd sit outside and listen in. He was not uh, entirely in favor of...